Uh, but that's that's that was my my thinking of religion was uh, that uh, that you had to be really weak to believe in a god um, because um, uh, because uh, uh, and that you needed a god to believe in versus I needed I needed no one to believe in because I was my own man and I was strong enough to do to control my life and do things instead of you praying for God to do something for you I was actually doing it while you were praying about it. Hello, and thanks for joining in. I'm Jana Harmon, and you're listening to Side B Stories, where we see how skeptics flip the record of their lives. Each podcast, we listen to someone who was once an atheist, but who became a Christian against all odds. You can also see these stories and more at our Side B Stories website at www.sidebstories.com. Oftentimes, atheists grow up in a world where there seems to be no apparent traces of God no reason to believe in God, no experiences of God in their lives. In my research with former atheists, the number one reason they gave for disbelieving God was that there was no subjective, no personal evidence for God in their lives. They didn't see or feel God either in their lives or in the world. In many Western secularized European countries, there are traces, artifacts of Christianity, of its historical presence and the remaining relics of architecture and its rituals and holidays. But there seems to be very little apparent belief in the lives of the people. The vibrant faith or hope that once was has been replaced with a settled independence and autonomy. For some, a felt isolation, emptiness, and darkness. Atheism seems then like a natural response to what is seen, what is felt, or perhaps what is not seen, and what is not felt. Although it may be existentially or emotionally desirable, it must be true, atheism that is, or so it is thought. But what happens when someone is driven to press beyond their culture, beyond their circumstances, beyond their personal despair, to look for something more in their and in their journey encounter unexpected life and joy and a real God who they believed not to exist. Alex's story is nothing short of fascinating. It is a story of, a, of moving from darkness to light, from depression to life. Alex moved from a world bereft of hope to someone who can't help but tell almost everyone he meets about the God who saved his life. He wants others to experience the joy and love he now radiates. I hope you'll come along to hear his amazing story of transformation and be inspired or challenged. I hope you'll stay to the end to hear him give advice to curious skeptics towards seriously considering the possibility of a real God as well as advice to Christians on how they can best engage with those who don't believe. Welcome to the podcast, Alex. It's so great to have you. I'm so happy to be with you, Jana. Wonderful. Alex, as we're getting started so the listeners can know a little bit about you, why don't you tell us about uh, your life right now? Yes. Um, first of all, like I said, I'm <clears throat> really happy to be with you. I always enjoy it. Uh, talking to you and seeing you at uh, different events. I feel like I haven't seen you in a while. But um, I live in uh, southwest Florida in uh, at a city called Fort Myers. And uh, I love living here. And I'm a full-time financial advisor. And I have some uh, Christian ministries on the side. And But I feel like I'm a Christian minister 24-7 because uh, we're called to be ministers uh, and, the go- and sharing the gospel of light to, uh, with everyone. Uh, that's wonderful, Alex. I can tell that you're not native to Fort Myers, Florida, though. I just, I I hear a very distinct accent, and so I'm very curious. Of course, I'm familiar with your story, but for, for all of us, take us back to where you were born, where you were raised. Talk us through that world. What did it look like um, in terms of religion, God, your family? How did you grow up? Yes, um, I, I was born in France. <clears throat> Excuse me. In 1972, in Paris, my parents were immigrants from a former Yugoslavia, and they grew up in that was a communist regime. And by the grace of God, even though they were not strong believers, they wanted freedom. And uh, my dad was in his 20s, 
And so uh, he was very fortunate to be able to leave uh, the former Yugoslavia and go to France, which was uh, when I was born and before I was born in the 60s, it was a wonderful country, uh, very welcoming to immigrants, very loving. Uh, the, the neighborhoods, even in Paris, were big families. And, and uh, uh, so I grew up in that environment. And I had a fairly normal childhood, even though my parents were not wealthy. They always provided. And uh, I have really nothing to complain about. Uh, the only thing is that I didn't like school very much. Um, and the reason was because uh, politically, I didn't see eye to eye with my teachers. My teachers were, a lot of them were Marxists. They were actually uh, promoting the ideology that my parents had fled from. Mm -hmm. So most of my friends were from a <clears throat> Muslim background and from North Africa. So uh, so I learned a lot about Islam and uh, and um, uh, with them, and, but I was not very religious to start with. Uh, we, we were what I call CEO Christians, Christmas and Easter only. We went to church only twice a year. And... Uh, <coughs> excuse me. And... Uh, um, and uh, so we, I was not very religious to start with, but then around the age of 13, 14, uh, my dad had a heart attack and I really, uh, really shook my world. And he really, uh, I dealt with a lot of internal pain because uh, I'm seeing my dad suffering and knowing that one day he would die because he was a heavy smoker and, and he had health issues. That really shook my faith. I didn't have much faith in God to start with, but then I made the... Um, uh, the decision that there was no benevolent God, no good God who cared about his creation because uh, that's what I thought because otherwise, why would you do that to my dad? You see how the roles get reversed. It's not the responsibility is not on, on people and how they live their lives, but rather it's on us uh, blaming God and shifting the responsibility to, to God because we don't want to accept our own. So that's, that's the environment that grew up and uh, I, I, um, I lived in France until the age of 20, from birth to 20, and I failed high school at the age of 20. Uh, so I, was, I, was, I had a really a difficult childhood because, um, because I didn't care for school. I didn't have any direction in life. I didn't have any foundation. Uh, I didn't have any peace or joy. Um, and I'm a fairly happy uh, person in general, but it was very hard for me. Okay. Uh, but that's, that's pretty much in a nutshell. Uh, what, what, how I grew up. Okay. Well, well, good. It sounds very interesting, challenging, especially in a culture where Marxism was becoming more prevalent, you know, a, yes. in a, in a world that, um, that, that your parents were trying to escape and then they, they found again. I'm wondering, especially as a Marxist worldview was um, entering into your culture and the nominal religion that you were experiencing really wasn't that meaningful. What, what did you think that God and religion and belief, what was all that? Uh, was it just some kind of a social activity that people went to, but it wasn't real or true? What, what, what were your perceptions of religious people then? Yes. Um, in America, a lot of, a lot of uh, people uh, perceive uh, religion as a social activity or uh, things of the nature, because a lot of the churches are uh, social clubs, but e or or organizations are social clubs uh, or charitable organizations. So that's how people perceived it. But in France, uh, France being one of the most secular countries in the world, uh, most people, including myself, perceived religion as uh, being something for for people who were um, ignorant, uh, who were uneducated and uh, people who were anti-scientific. Uh, so there was two sphere. And you can see that happening again. Everything that's happening in France is happening now, 40 years later in the United States, where you can see how uh, the, those who are atheists in America are trying to push us, push people of faith into the sphere of, 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 of uneducated and anti-scientific people, right? And so that's the way I perceive religion, for people who are fragile, People were weak, and and of course I was always uh, one of the most successful because I'm I'm a fairly driven person uh, in general. When I came to America, I started be becoming successful in my business. Uh, then that only made things worse of me seeing seeing myself a person who is not a person of faith being much stronger than any people of faith, uh, and seeing people of faith as being weak 
and fragile mentally and uh, needing a crutch and um, versus you know uh, not realizing that faith actually uh, is expect uh, and and Christianity and more in spe- more specifically is based on evidence it's not uh, it's not uh, devoid of evidence or devoid of intellectual belief mm-hmm. to the contrary and you know that all too well because of apologetics which you and I really respect and like uh, but that's that's that was my my thinking of religion was uh, that uh, that you had to be really weak to believe in a god um, because um, uh, because uh, uh, and that you needed a god to believe in versus I needed I needed no one to believe in because I was my own man and I was strong enough to do to control my life and do things instead of you praying for God to do something for you I was actually doing it while you were praying about it so but that's very common of people thinking that way right and uh, this this false uh, view that um, somehow uh, people of faith are weak and, and fragile and need a crutch because they're not strong enough on their own so that was pretty much my view of, of religion in general yeah that's interesting that that perception of of people who believe in god um that it is it is anti-intellectual in their in their eyes but yet you you made a decision to finally reject god because uh, he didn't show up which for you and for your father you know that mm-hmm. that he wasn't there that he allowed somehow your father to become in poor health um yeah. so it really was a, a real mixed bag wasn't it it was not social it was not scientific and yes. it was not intellectual um and yet and and yet there was this subjective reason too existential yes. that he he just didn't do the things that he was supposed to do. So, but it's true that it seems like uh, many people reject God not for intellectual reasons, actually, because if they did, uh, they were seeking intellectual reasons, they would actually find God um, if they were genuine. But it was there's always it seems like not always, but many times or most of the times a a, 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 a some kind of emotional element uh, to the equation where they they were hurt. I'd like to pause for a moment and tell you about our new Side B Stories website. Perhaps you or someone you know is questioning whether or not belief in God is even possible or credible, whether or not Christianity is worthy of belief. The trouble is, in our culture today, Christianity is viewed largely as a belief system for the weak, delusional and uneducated. It can be extremely difficult to break through the negativity and stereotypes to explore authentic, historic Christianity. If you're a skeptic or atheist, what would it take for you to consider the reality of God or the truth of Christianity? Or if you're a Christian, how can you better understand or engage with skeptics in a meaningful way? Our new Side B Stories website was created with you in mind. In addition to housing our podcast stories, it also features short video testimonies from former atheists and resources they have recommended or written about their own journeys to belief. And you'll hear their advice to skeptics on how to pursue a search for God and advice to Christians on how to engage with those who don't believe. We offer these stories from former skeptics on the Side B Stories website because there is no bigger question that affects your life than whether or not God is real or true, good or relevant. In a culture where Christianity is sometimes viewed unworthy of belief, Side B Stories shows what it did and does take for skeptics to become believers. You can find all of this by going to our new website, SideBeastories.com. We hope you'll take a look and share this wonderful resource with skeptics and Christians alike. Now back to our story. Yes, and that that certainly can at least be a a significant part of of many people's stories. Um, so Alex, is, so you, here you are, twenty years old. And you are in school or getting out of school. You're still living in France, but it's not uh, necessarily where you want to be at the moment. Talk us through that. To give us the next step in your story. Yes. Yeah, so I'm twenty years old. I just failed high school in France, which most uh, 
kids fail at 18 and then they're given another chance at 19 and usually they, they, they pass high school at 19. Well, I failed it at 20. And uh, so I really didn't see a point. And so that, that, that added to the depression too. And uh, but by, by grace of God, because God is so good that, that he knew my life from uh, before the foundation of the world, he knew where I would be, where, uh, where, uh, you know, where it would take me. Uh, he had his, his hand on, on my life and I didn't know any of it, but uh, he sent me uh, my dad's assistant at work. Uh, she overheard that I wanted to leave uh, Europe and go to the United States. I don't even know why United States. Um, I have no idea why I kept saying the U.S. I didn't really know anything about the U.S., maybe because I wanted to make money, maybe America was rich. I really don't know. I don't remember. But I kept telling people I wanted to go to the United States, and my dad's assistant at work overheard that. And she said, Alex, how are you going to leave? How are you going to go there? I said, I really don't know. I don't know anybody there. But I will really need to leave, or otherwise I don't know if I'm going to end up here. Uh, I may commit suicide because I really hate my life and I hate uh, being here. Uh, she said, my, we have a, uh, an American missionary from Kentucky, and uh, she organizes trips for kids to go to America for a few months. Uh, you should meet her because she's leaving next Tuesday. So you better believe it. I woke up on Sunday and went to church, not because I wanted to meet God, but because I could meet somebody who can help me because it was all about me, right? It was all about me, and I was going to do whatever it takes uh, for my wishes and desires to be fulfilled, even if it meant uh, telling people that I'm a Christian, uh, because uh, all that mattered was uh, me getting ahead. So I met this lady, and again, by the grace of God, she helped me. Why would she help me? Uh, because I expect, you see what happens when you think a certain way, you project your thinking onto other people. You think that everybody else is like you, right? So because I was all calculating and only doing things that benefit me, I would never do something for you voluntarily because it doesn't help me. Then I projected that onto her. I'm like, well, why would she help me? What's, what's in there for her? So I, my expectations were very low. But then a month or two later, I got a letter in the mail and I picked it up. And I read it, and she said that she had found a family for me. And I just want to cry right now because, you know, it brings so much memories to me. And how she found a family in Illinois and that they would welcome me for a year to go to high school. I cried, and I ran, and I ran. I could have run a marathon. I had so much energy. I ran through Paris. I probably ran through a third of the a, of a whole city. <laughs> I was so excited. And uh, I couldn't stop crying and, and being so joyful, uh, so happy. And uh, so anyway, so that was the beginning of my, of my journey. And I came to America October 2nd, 1992. And that was an interesting day because I came. I didn't speak English. I had $200 in my pocket. And I had not met any Americans besides this lady. And... Uh, uh, but I, when I landed at the, at the Indianapolis airport, I had honestly felt like I had come home. And uh, and as, like I said, the United States is not perfect. And I didn't understand why. Uh, why would I be so excited? Uh, and uh, But I, then I found out that uh, later on that, you know, it was basically the Judeo-Christian roots of his nation. There was something in the air. There was a Holy Spirit. And I could sense the Holy Spirit, but I didn't know what was going on. So I started working. I went to school and was supposed to go to high school for one year. And during that year, I learned language, just a little bit of a language for after three months. And I said, you know, I'm wasting my time in high school. I'm not going to get any degrees. How about I go to community college? So I asked my parents. My parents were poor because after my dad had a heart attack, his business, uh, and he also lost a business. He did business with a former Yugoslavia and put a lot of money into it. And, and then Yugoslavia went into a civil, civil war. So he basically lost everything. But my parents borrowed, and they always said yes to everything I, I wanted. Uh, and um, also I want to mention that I grew up, and and, and uh, the two things that I'm really proud of uh, that, 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 um, that uh, happened in my, in my parents' lives is that my mom was always... Uh, me growing up and before I was born was a fortune teller mm -hmm. and she uh, she when my dad lost his job she was uh, cleaning houses and and uh, he was making uh, it was a breadwinner but then when he had a heart attack and couldn't really work much she went into a profession of being fortune teller and won all kinds of prizes and things of that nature but God always protected me and he always protected me and uh, I never was interested in any of it because as an atheist, I was a hardcore atheist. To me, all of that was uh, quite silly. And thank God, I did not dabble in that stuff. And then my dad got really, really into uh, masonry, 
Freemasons and was moving up the ladder because my dad was looking for brotherhood. He was looking for that kind of solidarity, for that kind of uh, family, right? And he found it initially in the Masons. So my dad was moving up the ladder and was so proud uh, to move up the ladder. He finally found something that he could uh, invest himself in, give himself into uh, you know, brothers and, and moving up the ladder. He was really proud. My dad was very disappointed in the Masons he, he, at the end of his life and he felt like they were all in there for themselves and they were not interested really in, 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 in investing in other people, but they were there to get something out of it. So he was very disappointed. But here's the thing I want to tell you about my parents. My dad, in 1996, on his deathbed, uh, he had open heart surgery and he got an infection. 11 people died from the infection. He, uh, he was the last one to die. He was there eight weeks on uh, getting dialysis every day. Uh, he was on his deathbed. Eight weeks before he died, uh, he had an out-of-body, out near-death experience, and he met Jesus face to face. And that, to me, is so incredible. And I talked to, talk to, of course, you know, Dr. Gary Habermas, and I don't know if, if many people know who are watching your show, but I imagine many do. Uh, but Dr. Habermas, if you don't know, is one of the lead experts, if not the lead expert on the resurrection of Christ, and he's written some books on the uh, on near-death experiences. So I went to Dr. Abraham and said, Gary, is this a near-death experience of my dad? And I explained how he met Jesus. He said, Alex, not only is it a near-death experience, it's the most common near-death experience that people uh, uh, that people experience when they meet Jesus, and that is about, uh, crossing a body of water. Uh, because the water, I imagine, uh, signifies the Holy Spirit. But anyway, so he came back to his body, and he was instantly born again. So everybody who walked into his room, he would say, sit down, I want to tell you about Jesus. And of course, all his friends were secular. <laughs> so they would say, I don't want to hear about Jesus. So I'll say, I'm sorry, if you don't want to hear about Jesus, then you have to. You have the door is right there, so uh, you can just leave right now. And said, no, but I want to see you. Well, then I'm going to tell you about Jesus. <laughs> so so he, he told everybody about Jesus uh, before he died. So I, obviously, as an atheist, I didn't believe my dad's experience. I thought he was, uh, he was, uh, he was from the drugs, that he was hallucinating, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and that was seven years before my experience. Uh, yeah, uh, 96, 2003, yeah, seven years. And then my mom, uh, after I became a Christian, and she gave up uh, uh, fortune telling, I got rid of her cards. And stop doing that and start reading your Bible. So I started working after four years of university. I started working for a company, a major company, as a financial advisor. So I'm an atheist. Um, now I'm, I'm, uh, I arrived in 1992. I finished my studies. Now I got hired to work as a financial advisor in 1997. So I'm still unhappy with myself. But I'm telling myself, you know what? That's because you're poor. Once you become rich and you can afford buying anything you want, then you're going to be happy, obviously. Uh, now, Right now, the stress of life and not having funds to do what you want to do, uh, that's what's keeping you from being happy. So I started moving up the ladders. I worked very, very hard. And, uh, and then in 2003, my ex-wife, 2002, sorry, 2002, my ex-wife left me. And she left me, and that really destroyed my world because she was my God. She was my everything. Not even money. Money was secondary, second, secondary to her. She was my idol. And uh, when she left me and left me for good, uh, my whole world fell apart. And I went through six months of severe depression. Uh, and in April of 2003, I decided to go home, finish my week, go home and commit suicide. And uh, mm -hmm. that was, I was still in the same place where I'm at now in southwest Florida. Uh, so I finished my affairs and went home. I'm making the story, long story short, uh, and uh, because there are a lot of details. But I went home to commit suicide, sat down, started contemplating on my life, contemplating how I was going to commit suicide. And the only thing I could think of um, was my mother and my nephews and my sister, and how tomorrow, when I'm not there and, and the news uh, is brought to them that I committed suicide, how they would react. And I knew they would suffer for life. So now I was, for the first time in my life, I felt like I was not in control of my life anymore. I was at a dead end, uh, a moral dilemma that I could not come up with a solution with. One, I didn't want to live. I, couldn't, I didn't want, did not want to wake up another day to, to face life, which fi life was evil. People were evil. I was the only good person in the world. That's how delusional I was. 
that I was the best person in the world and the whole rest of the world was evil. Uh, but at the same time, I couldn't commit suicide because of my mom, my sister, and my nephews. So at that moment, I was going to turn, without even knowing, I decided the only solution I could think of was that I was going to turn over my life to the devil. Now, I didn't think of it in those terms, but I decided, you know what? I'm just going to live like everyone else. I'm just going to take advantage of every single person, uh, financially, sexually, in whichever way. I'm just going to live for my own selfish, because I was already selfish, but I didn't see it that way. I saw myself as a moral human being, uh, but I was going to turn over my life over to, to completely to the devil. And mm -hmm. at that moment, I cried out, out of anguish because something in me was uh, ignited. And I cried out, and my soul left my body, and I saw my whole life coming in front of my eyes and how Jesus had walked with me from the beginning of, of, of life when I, when I was born and how he protected me. And I saw my whole life. It was more beautiful than a Hollywood movie. It was so vivid and so beautiful. And then I came back to my body. And I, people, when I, people tell me, I don't believe you, Alex. I said, I really don't mind you not believing me. I don't care because I wouldn't have believed myself. I didn't believe my dad having experience. So I, why would I expect you to believe it? But one thing you cannot explain is how I came, after I came back to my body, I went from total depression to total joy, total uh, depression to total love. I felt like I had so much love in me, I had to unbutton my, my, my shirt because I thought my chest was going to explode out of love. And since mm -hmm. then, I've, I've carried that joy of the Lord, and, uh, uh, and no one can truly explain that. So, so that's when I met the Lord. And, uh, and then it was 11 p.m., around 11 p.m. Uh, at night. So I'm like, who do I call to tell what happened, to, to explain and, and, and tell them what happened? And of course, it was too late to call Europe. So I called my Muslim friend, uh, local, and I said, well, he's religious. And I know that the most religious people I know are Muslims because they give, they, they give the appearance of being the most religious, just like the Pharisees. Uh, and they give the appearance of, of being religious. Uh, but again, that doesn't mean that they are born again, that they have the Holy Spirit in them. So I called my Muslim, Muslim friend and I said, you have to help me. I said, come over and I'm going to explain everything that happened to you. So I went to his place and he said, Alex, everything that happened to you is in the Quran. You have to read the Quran, everything. But I said, but, but why the Quran? This is Jesus. I felt Jesus. I didn't see him, but I felt Jesus. Uh, he, Jesus is Catholic. He's not Muslim. He said, no, no, no. He said, no, no, no. <laughs> well, that's how much information I had. <laughs> that's how much knowledge I had. <laughs> that he was Roman Catholic and not, you know. And he said, no, no, no. He was Muslim. See. Muslim, Jesus was Muslim? Absolutely was Muslim. Yes, you'll see it all over the Quran. I said, wow. But he said, yeah, he's just, we don't believe in his God. And I'm like, well, that makes sense. You know, maybe, yeah, maybe he's not God. Why would he be God? He's just a human being. So anyway, so I started reading the Quran before I read the Bible, but I read it with the Holy Spirit. And what happened within days, if not minutes, I can't say minutes, but I would be willing to bet minutes, but within days, uh, for sure, I could tell this was not a religion a, a, from God. That was not a revelation from God. And I started going back to my Muslim friend and friends in France. And they all started telling me, um, I don't know which Quran you're reading, but you're reading the wrong Quran. I said, well, this is a, the Quran I bought. I said, no, no, no. Here, I'll get you the right one. I said, okay. So I have seven Qurans. And all seven Qurans say the same thing. Uh, but they even they didn't know that what I was showing, pointing out to them, was in their Quran. That's how uh, ignorant so many people of faith are. Mm -hmm. They don't even know what's in their holy books, yeah. including Christians. Right. People who uh, claim to be Christians don't know what the Bible teaches. So, uh, so I, 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 sorry, I went back to, to my friends. And when I went back to France, I, I, I did the same thing with my best friend that I grew up with, Kamal. And I said, Kamal, look what it says in the Quran. And I was not a Christian per se yet. I was seeking, even though I was born again, and it was just a matter of time. But he had to make sense intellectually. And that's why uh, apologetics is important. That's why uh, Paul speaks of renewing the mind in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Because just because you're born again, you still have to work on, on, on renewing your mind and, 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 intel and, and really work on and reading the Bible and work on, your, on loving God with all of your mind. Because if you don't, you're going to start believing things. Even as a born-again person, you could believe things that are false. Right. And uh, so anyway, so that's, 
Uh, that's what I was doing. And I, I told my best friend in France, and I want to show it to him. He really, his faith was really shaken. And and then later on, I baptized him, you know, and he became a believer. So that was really beautiful. So uh, so I studied for a year and a half. And what really helped me uh, was apologetics. And that's why I like apologetics so much. And uh, specifically one book, The Case for Christ. And of course, you know that book, Lee Strobel. And that really, really helped me. And I was like, wow. It has so much evidence. And then I started reading uh, people who, once I, I, I was like, this Christianity is so, it's based on evidence. It's, it's not uh, devoid of intellectual belief or reasoning. Uh, then I started reading people like Bert Ehrman and things of that nature. And then I started realizing how weak his arguments are and how some, even some, sometime, and I know many people are friends with him, Christians, and they don't want to use these words, but how dishonest some of the arguments are so a year and a half later uh, finally i knew 99.999 percent that jesus was who he claimed to be in the bible and the bible was the word of god and then i always remember my jamaican friend said alex what are you waiting for i'm, oh, I'm waiting for 100 percent." he said no alex please you know if you wait for 100 percent, you, you're never going to get 100 mm-hmm. percent. you're at 99.999 percent i think that's enough so tonight you should give your life to christ and i did and even though I was born again, that was a commitment. It's like it's like loving a, a, a woman and wanting to marry her, and marrying her. Yes. Doesn't you know? If the love is there, if the love is there, the passion is there, right? But still, making that commitment was quite quite uh, quite important for me. And when I did, I regretted immediately that I had not done it a year and a half mm. or, uh, earlier. But I had to go through, through what I had to go through. That's part of life. But then what I did. I went and got a master's degree at Biola University online in apologetics, and I learned so much, and I was I loved it. I met some great people, uh, great professors, and I learned so much. That was that gave me a foundation for uh, for apologetics. And then one time, uh, and uh, my 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 mission, my mission, not God's mission, my mission was to be a, a prophet or or a minister to America. I absolutely did not want to go anywhere else because I still love this country so much and I didn't like the rest of the world. So why would I want to go elsewhere? Well, that's that was my thinking, but my plans are not God's plans. So I went to France one time and I met a man that God told me, told me his name. And when I met him, it was a confirmation that I was supposed to meet him. So I explained my testimony like I did to you, but in just in five minutes. And he looked at me and said, uh, Alex, Next year, I'm organizing the first debate between uh, public debate in France between uh, Muslims, radical Muslims, and Christians. You will be the Christian. And I looked at him and said, um, No, <laughs> absolutely <laughs> not, sir. Absolutely not. I appreciate you trusting me. And, uh, uh, but A, I haven't spoken French in years, and my French is really rusty. B, my whole theological uh, training in apologetics and Islam uh, is in English. So I don't even know the translation, the words in French. And C, my ministry is to America, not to France. I don't like France. So he said, um, uh, sorry, God told me you don't have to do it. And I'm like, okay. So, uh, I understand you heard, you think you heard from God, uh, but I assure you, you didn't hear from God. <laughs> but uh, I said, but I said, so I had one question for him. I said, Saeed, I what if I lose? What if I lose? I'm not an expert. What if I lose? And I love his answer. And that answer stayed with me ever, ever, ever since. Um, because sometimes we are our own worst enemies. We will, uh, you know, we will say, oh, I'm not equipped. I'm not good enough. I'm not this. I'm not that. And we don't do the things we should be doing instead of just jumping in faith and letting God be God through us, right? Yes. So he looked at me and said, Alex, we, you cannot lose because we won 2,000 years ago. And he said, he said you go and, and open yourself to God, and I promise you good things will happen. I'm like, all right, now you're putting it on me and my conscience. So I said, okay, sir, but uh, I'll try my best. He said, you'll be fine. So I did the debate and more debates and more debates. Looking back now, people either converted that I debated. So I baptized a, an imam. The second most influential imam in France, I baptized him, is thriving now, uh, preaching the gospel all around the world. Wow. The, the, the one person I debated the most 
who, according to me, would never come to Christ and is still not uh, confessing uh, his faith in Jesus, but he should because he, a couple of years ago, came out and publicly said that the, the crucifixion of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus are the two most assur assured uh, historical facts of antiquity. So this is for a Muslim who did not, who supposedly Muslims, you know, they, they denied that Jesus was crucified and 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 thus uh, resurrected. So God has been really uh, using me, and by the grace, by, by His grace, and uh, and I'm still surprised when I'm on your show or when I'm speaking about God because it's not like I was the the, the, the best candidate for those kind of things. Uh, God has opened some doors, and I've been able to minister to people in power, and that's been really quite uh, amazing. Amazing uh, that God has opened those doors, but uh, and I so that so that's my 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 uh, uh, prayer request. If people of you are watching your show, listening, uh, that they would pray that God would send more souls in my life because I love seeing people. When somebody comes to Christ, I get like my faith gets multiplied, not addition. You know, it's not an addition; it's a multiplication. And when you see people coming to Christ, it's just the most beautiful thing. And then you realize that what you're doing is, is worth it. It's completely worth it. But, uh, but even if we don't see it, we still should be doing it uh, because that's what we're called to do. And uh, there, uh, the harvest is plentiful, as we're told, but few are the workers, right? right? So the two things are important is discipling and preaching the gospel. Those are the priorities. And when we do those things, we know 100% that God is on our side, that God will always will, will always be in His will and He is going to honor our efforts because He will bless those efforts by the power of His Holy Spirit. We're going to take a break for a moment from our story so that I can tell you about the C.S. Lewis Institute Fellows Program. This program is a 12-month discipleship course that focuses on monthly themes related to theology, spiritual formation, and apologetics. Through the structure of a strong curriculum, like-minded community, and a one-on-one -on -one mentorship, our fellows encounter a life-changing experience that develops them to grow deeper in their faith as disciples of Christ. The C.S. Lewis Institute is now accepting applications for this fellows program. It is offered in 15 different cities and is for Christians who are seeking to broaden their Christian education and deepen their personal faith. To learn more and to find out if you live in a city where the Fellows Program is offered, please visit www.cslewisinstitute.org. Now we'll return to our story. Well, those are powerful words, Alex, and just amazing, amazing testimony. Talk about going from darkness to light or depression to joy. I love the way that you you really spoke to that. Your 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 life really shows demonstrates that contrast of just lostness, I guess you could say, and just yeah. looking and then finding in such a profound way the person of Christ. So unexpected, really. Um, I mean, you said you were actually calling out for darkness, and you found light, and said Jesus showed up. Uh, like he had done in your the, the life of your father and even your mother and showed up to you. It's uh, just incredible. It's incredible. And I think it, your story may surprise some people in terms of the, the spiritual experiential nature of it. But for me, I guess, having heard your story before, I've, I've spent some time in France with a church in France and, mm -hmm. and hearing, um, Really, if I can say this, the oppression, the spiritual oppression and the darkness that is being experienced there and the power of spiritual darkness there and hearing more stories like yours where darkness is broken by powerful spiritual experiences. So uh, for me, it's it's not a surprise, but for our listeners, it may be. And But you're one among many, and I want to make that really clear that the Lord works in very powerful and personal and experiential ways, even today in the West. Um, it's not just in, in unknown parts of the world. It's where God needs to be revealed, and he reveals himself in, in uh, ways that cannot be denied. I mean, obviously, in your life, your life took a, a, just a 
complete change immediately, just like your father, and to where you you cannot help, uh, like uh, you can't help um, talking to others about Christ, and 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 that is your mission in life. It's so so very clear. It's it's compelling uh, and inspiring. And, and I'm wondering now for those who may be curious about your story, who are not believers, who are are skeptical, is willing to perhaps look, may be open, uh, because obviously they're intrigued by your story and the complete life change that you've had based on what you believe to be true and real and good uh, yes. and very relevant to your life. Uh, what would you say to the curious skeptic who may be listening in? Yes, very good question. Yes, um, you're not alone. Uh, most people are, are are have questions, and 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 many people have actually good questions. And uh, so, just because someone you ask, someone who believes in God, doesn't have the answer, doesn't mean the answer is not there. Uh, a lot of people are not trained to give answers. That's the sad part. Uh, all of the um, the Ivy League schools were founded for for students to be trained to give answers to those objection objections, but. The church today, sadly, has gotten too comfortable over too long and has not trained people to give answers. Uh, because what is the church? One is for to go and, and be in communion with the body and to worship together and be with the body. But two is to train us, to prepare us to go to the world. And that's what the church is about. And sadly, the church has not trained uh, uh, the, its people to go and, and, and answer those objections. So... If you have questions and objections, please reach out to to us, um, and uh, because there are answers, I promise you, answers to every objection. Now, do 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 are are the answers like always specific? For example, if you your question is, why did this specifically happen to me? Well, we we're not God, so we don't we we may not know why specifically something happens at a certain time. But if it is an intellectual objection. Some kind of objection to God, His existence, uh, or 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 the Bible's veracity, or Jesus's crucifixion, or His deity, whatever it is, uh, there uh, like uh, the Christian faith is based on evidence, and uh, and you can see that if uh, Luke, when he opens uh, his his gospel, his first chapter, he tells us that uh, that that, and he's a physician. He's not. He was not a uneducated. Uh, person, he was a very educated man. He tells us that the accounts uh, were written. It's a historical uh, account of what eyewitnesses and those who were disciples or companions of eyewitness what they saw with their own eyes. The evidence, uh, the, the Christianity, is based on on evidence. And so, if you have objections, if you have questions, uh, please reach out to us. Uh, seek because we are promised in the Bible. If you're seeking. Uh, with the right kind of attitude, not seeking to to for for sole objection to 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 uh, attack Christianity or to deny it. If that's your sole um, sole uh, priority or or, or objective, uh, then you're not seeking with the right uh, uh, mind and with the right heart. But if you're objective and if you're seeking, you're like I truly want the truth. I truly I'm willing to take wherever the truth takes me. I will be willing to go. I promise you, you will get the, the answers. I promise you, because the answers are there. And uh, and the contrast will become so clear between the truth and veracity, the truth of Christianity and the veracity of the Bible, and the falsehood of everything else that has come. So um, uh, reach out to me or to Jenna or wh whomever it is. Please reach out to us because we are there to help, uh, because we have been helped. The reason I'm here where I'm at is because I want a truth. I didn't care about pe about people's uh, personalities or character or or, or or what they did, whether they're sinful, sinless. What I wanted the truth. I had questions, and I want answers to those questions. So you should have the same attitude. Sadly, many people reject uh, Christianity because uh, they've had a bad experience. And I remember one time one one guy said, "Oh, I reject. I stopped going to church once I saw my priest uh, buying a lottery ticket." What does that have to do with your relationship with God, right? Relationship with people. We 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 ought to be seeking God, not seeking pe people. Our faith is not in people. But if you have uh, questions and objections, seek the answers to those questions. 
uh, and not not uh, not the uh, uh, not people and 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 their their because we don't want to be uh, you know many people join Mormonism or Islam because they're looking for community the same reason my dad joined the Masons because he was looking for community he was looking for brotherhood right so he found it initially but that doesn't make that does not make uh, Mormonism or Islam or or Masons uh, true uh, Freemasonry true. Uh, so seek the answer to your to questions. Remove emotions. Uh, we're, we're emotional beings, and trust me, I'm one of the most emotional people you'll meet. But remove emotions from the equation. When you're seeking truth, uh, you're removing emotions from the equation, and you're looking for answers to to your to your objections. Well, and you'll find them. That's wonderful. And and I and I wonder if you have a word for the Christian too. I've heard you speak about the need for training, preparation. Yes. The, yes. the encouragement to be on mission for God, uh, to be prayerful. Yes. I wonder if you could speak to any of those things or whatever's on your yes. heart for the Christian. And we need to hold, uh, help one another because we need one another. No one is an island. No one is, we're not created to be lone rangers. We're created to be a body. That's what the, 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 the Bible speaks of. It compares the church to a body where I am may be the arm and uh, and then you may be the eye and the, the other person is the ear. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But how is one b- part of the body going to function without the rest of the body? And how is how powerful is the, the whole body when it comes together? You know, when we come together and we're united, nothing can stop us. Absolutely nothing can stop us. But the enemy wants to divide this body. So that's the work of the enemy. So if we come together and, and we, we, we train one another and we help one another, uh, you don't have to go to seminary. You don't have to go get a PhD in apologetics. Just go to a group of men and you will learn so much one from the other and then maybe do some ministry together as a group and, and, then, and, uh, and go preach the gospel or minister to the poor or orphans and the widows. It doesn't matter doesn't matter, do something and you're going to see a result and it's going to be uh, quite visible and it's going to be quite powerful. Thank you for that challenge. It, your story truly has been completely inspiring, Alex. Just your person, the way that you radiate Christ and your, your passion for Him, not only your intellect but also your mission. You have found life abundant and you want to give it away and you're looking for the best for the other and it's, it's incredible truly incredible. So I thank you for coming on to share your story with us today, Alex. Thank you so much. And all glory to Jesus. All glory to Him. Uh, because, uh, uh, you know, I, used, I was blind. And when you're blind, uh, I cannot choose to see. I was blind and He's the one who gave me the sight. So all glory to yes, Him. Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in to Side B Stories today to hear Alex's story. You can find out more about Alex by looking at the episode notes and his contact information there. For questions and feedback about this episode, you can reach me by visiting our Sybe Stories website. Again, that's SybeStories.com. If you enjoyed it, follow, rate, and review, and share our podcast with your friends and social network. We would really appreciate it. In the meantime, I'll be looking forward to seeing you next time, where we'll see how another skeptic flips the record of their life.